Welcome to an A to Z guide for working with patients with memory loss and dementia. The objectives of this session are to gain proficiency in brief cognitive screening to help improve detection of memory loss among older patients, to describe evidence-based medication and non-medication interventions known to improve outcomes, to learn how to best support patients and care partners in accessing services, to identify common health risks associated with caregiving and address the needs of caregivers, and to recognize how to incorporate health equity principles into a dementia assessment, diagnosis, and care. We're going to start with an introduction to ACT on Alzheimer's. ACT on Alzheimer's is a statewide volunteer-driven collaboration that involves over 60 public and private organizations and hundreds of people working together to create supportive communities for people living with dementia and caregivers. It is the group that was charged with implementing Minnesota's state plan on Alzheimer's disease. Act on Alzheimer's has five shared goals with a health equity perspective. These goals include identifying and investing in promising approaches, raising awareness and reducing stigma, equipping communities, sustaining caregivers, and increasing detection and improving care. Today, we're gonna to focus on increasing detection and improving care. This group within ACT on Alzheimer's developed a toolkit for providers that includes evidence and consensus-based practice standards for Alzheimer's care. Tools and resources were created for primary care providers, care coordinators, community agencies, and patients and care partners. Today, we'll focus on the tools developed for care coordinators. This is an image of the tool created for care coordinators. You can find this on the ACT on Alzheimer's website. The link is mentioned below. We'll be reviewing this tool today as we go through the presentation. Before we start though, let's start with basics. Dementia and Alzheimer's disease. What is the difference between dementia and Alzheimer's disease? This is the number one question asked by participants in education sessions. Dementia is an overarching term that describes a set of symptoms like memory loss, forgetfulness, confusion, but it does not tell you the origin of those symptoms. It doesn't tell you what disease is causing those symptoms. Alzheimer's disease is the leading cause of dementia, accounting for 60 to 80% of cases seen. There are other diseases that cause dementia, Lewy body disease, for example, which is on the Parkinson's spectrum and is common in patients who have Parkinson's disease, vascular dementia, which is stroke-related, and frontotemporal dementia, which uh, affects either personality or language, depending on the variant of frontotemporal dementia. What are the unique challenges and opportunities associated with Alzheimer's disease? Today we're gonna to focus on Alzheimer's disease because it is the leading cause of dementia. And if you can address that form of dementia, this will help you as you work with other patients who have other types of dementia. Alzheimer's is a public health crisis. The problem is immense. Currently, 5.3 million Americans have Alzheimer's disease, and this number is expected to reach nearly 14 million by 2050. Almost two-thirds of the people with Alzheimer's disease are women, largely because of the longer life expectancy of women, although men are catching up. If the disease could be detected earlier, the incidence would be much higher. There's a preclinical stage of the disease where pathology exists in the brain, but there are no active symptoms, and that lasts for 10 to 20 years. Some populations are at higher risk, including older African Americans, who are twice as likely as whites to develop the disease, and older Hispanics, who are 1.5 times as likely as whites, largely due to health disparities. This is why it's important to look at all we're doing through a lens of health equity. Health equity refers to the attainment of the highest level of health for all people, and it's important that we create tools and resources for all people who are living with dementia and in essence create a curb cut by promoting cultural competence across all individuals who are older and may be living with cognitive impairment. 
Age is the greatest risk factor for Alzheimer's disease, and one in nine people over 65, about 11%, have Alzheimer's disease. This number rises to one in three people over 85, a staggering 32%. So in your practice, if you have people of this age, you should be having in the chart, or in the records, uh, about 30% of your patients over 85 with a diagnosis. Unfortunately, that's not the case. Alzheimer's disease is horribly under-recognized by providers and in the medical system. In fact, less than 50% of patients receive a formal diagnosis. That means millions are unaware that they have dementia or Alzheimer's disease. The diagnosis is often delayed on average six years after symptoms begin, and there is typically significant impairment in function by the time the diagnosis is made. Many times the diagnosis is made at the time of crisis, during a hospitalization or after a hospitalization, or when the patient does something unexpected or dangerous. While rarely characterized as such, Alzheimer's is a chronic condition and disease that we must pay attention to in the same way we address other chronic conditions like diabetes and heart disease. People with dementia who receive primary care have on average 2.5 chronic conditions and take five or more medications. They're also three times more likely to be admitted to hospitals at higher per person payment rates and for a variety of often preventable conditions, including dehydration, urinary tract infection, pneumonia, and delirium. It's clear that there is a correlation between chronic conditions and cost, and that's not any different for people with dementia who have a lot of both. So let's start with the tool, the Act on Alzheimer's tool for recognizing dementia by care coordinators. What I want to emphasize here is that care coordinators and care managers can and should assess cognition. It's important to understand that objective measures are superior to self-measures or self-report or subjective measures. In the algorithm in the tool, we start by doing a brief cognitive screen. I'll introduce you to the Minicog and show you how that works. It's a three-minute in-person screen. If there is a normal score, monitoring the patient over time is appropriate. If the patient fails the Minicog, uh, they can receive Additional testing or the additional testing can be administered or a referral to the physician requesting a dementia workup. After a diagnosis is made, there is additional information in the tool that we'll review about next steps and developing a care plan. But let's start again with identifying cognitive impairment among your patients. Anytime that you're doing uh, screening or using a screening instrument, uh, it's important in the clinical interview to let the patient answer the questions without help and to keep in mind that social skills remain intact until very late in dementia. Don't be fooled by a good sense of humor, reliance on old memories, or a quiet demeanor. Uh, don't be fooled also by people saying they don't know what day it is because they don't read the paper or they're retired. Um, don't be fooled by this. Unfortunately, most of us do not recognize signs and symptoms of Alzheimer's disease in their, until they're quite pronounced. Uh, many people attribute the changes in memory to aging alone and not a disease process. What do you expect? She's 80. Um, based on diagnostic rates, we know that subjective impressions fail to detect dementia in the early stages. We know that eyeballing whether or not someone has dementia or just trying to detect it in a conversation results in less than 50% detection rates that we have now. So what are some red flags that you can be looking for when you're talking with patients? If you're able to review the, uh, the patient's medical record or chart before uh, the patient comes to you, take a look at the chart and look for any memory concerns, forgetfulness, or memory complaints listed by the physician in the chart. That's often a red flag that cognitive impairment might be present. If the emergency contact is the main contact person, in other words, you're uh, instructed to contact the daughter or the spouse instead of the patient, that's a pretty significant red flag. If the patient is on Aricept or Dinepazil or any other acetylcholinesterase inhibitor, or you see that in the medical record, that's a 
major red flag, even if no diagnostic diagnosis is rec- recorded. Some things you can do or think about when you're asking people questions or going through the assessment, instead of asking, are you taking your medication or are you doing something? Uh, instead, ask, how are you taking your medications or how are you doing X, Y, or Z? This can get people talking to you. It's pretty well documented in the literature that yes no questions are easy to answer for people with even severe impairment and often people who have dementia will answer in the way that they believe you'd like them to answer so you get very little accurate information. Uh, Repetition is not normal in a 7 to 10 minute conversation. You wouldn't do that and neither should someone who's 85 years old. So if you sense repetition or if you hear repetition in a 7 to 10 minute conversation, it's a red flag. As are tangential circumstantial responses, losing track of conversation, frequently deferring answers to family members. In other words, when you ask the patient a question, they look at their spouse for the answer. That that isn't that's a major red flag over reliance on old information or memories and obviously once someone is inattentive to appearance has unexplained weight loss or a failure to thrive there's something significantly wrong there Um, and you could think about cognition among other things now again red flags are red flags they're not a diagnostic indicator they're simply an indicator that you should explore more in terms of practice tips When talking with the family, any instance whatsoever reported of getting lost while driving, trouble following a recipe, asking the same questions repeatedly, or mistakes paying bills are red flags for cognitive impairment. You should take these concerns seriously and know that by the time family members report these types of symptoms, they have typically been present for quite some time and are getting worse. I would also challenge you to raise your expectations of older adults. Ask yourself, if this patient was alone on a domestic flight across the country and the trip required a layover with a gate change, would he or she be able to manage that kind of mental task on his or her own? If the answer is not likely for a patient of any age, this is a major red flag for cognitive impairment. An intact older adult should be able to describe at least two current events in adequate detail, who, what, when, where, why. Again, don't let someone tell you they never leave the house. They will know two current events. They should also be able to describe events of national significance. Ask them, what happened on 9-11? Everyone should be able to tell you this. Um, And be sure they tell you the right thing. I've had patients tell me that uh, bombs went off in New York. Well, that's not exactly what happened. What happened in New Orleans? You don't even have to say anything more than that. Everyone can tell you that there was a hurricane or Hurricane Katrina. Patients should be able to name or describe the current president and an immediate predecessor. I've had patients tell me that the current president Uh, was African-American and maybe, you know, that his name was Obama uh, or Barack. Uh, But when I asked them who was the immediate predecessor, I've had people tell me that it was uh, Franklin Roosevelt. So be attuned to this. Patients should also be able to describe their own recent medical history and report the conditions for which they take medicine. If they cannot do this, Even if they don't have Alzheimer's disease, it's a significant red flag in terms of managing one's own health or medications. Let's take a minute to talk about cognitive screening. There are literally hundreds of screening tools available, and they vary greatly by length, sensitivity, and specificity, and the ability to detect dementia accurately and in a timely manner. Uh, The MMSC has been widely used in the past, but has several notable limitations. Uh, For example, it was developed over 40 years ago when our understanding of myocognitive impairment and dementia was much different. Uh, The tool is weighted heavily toward cognitive skills that do not deteriorate until later stages of the disease. And it takes about 10 minutes to administer, which is also, or which is often too long to use or to to have in, in, in normal clinic use. In the last 40 years, substantial research has been conducted on various tools. The mini-cog slums 
which is a terrible name, but a great tool. And the mocha are among the very sharpest instruments available, so we'll focus today on these three tools. First, a few tips on screening administration. Um, it's important not to raise a patient's anxiety by using the words like test or memory. Uh, the screen can be intro introduced as a checkup from the neck up or by talking to patients about how medicine is moving more and more toward prevention. Uh, just like the nurse monitors your blood pressure, heart and lungs on a routine basis when you come to the clinic, uh, we now know that it's important to monitor the health of the brain on a routine basis. So you can also say something like, we're going to do something next that requires a little bit of concentration. Also, try not to allow the patient to give up prematurely or skip questions. Uh, some lighthearted encouragement will go a long way. Oh, come on, you can do it. Things like that. Oh, these are hard, but, you know, they're hard for a reason, and just give it a try. Those are things that can help. Never deviate from standardized instructions. Don't offer multiple choice answers, and don't be soft on scoring. Nurses and social workers who are wonderful people, very caring people, often want patients to do well and will be a little bit soft on scoring to make sure they uh, get it right. I've seen people actually give hints, and I've done that myself, actually. Um, but there is padding in the test uh, for normal errors, so be strict on scoring. So let's talk about the mini-cog. The MINICOG is a verbal recall test. Subjects are asked to recall three words and paired with a clock draw test. You can see a description here. You're asking um, patients to remember the time at 10 past 11. Now, why would setting the time for 10 past 11 be a sensitive marker of cognitive decline? The answer is that time is an abstract concept. 10 after 11 is symbolically represented uh, by the, the 2 and the 11. Our brains do this type of men mental gymnastics easily because we do not have dementia, but with patients with early Alzheimer's disease who lose symbolic abstract thinking, uh, a common response is to draw one line to the 10 and one line to the 11 because those are the two numbers you mention in the instructions. Their thinking becomes much more concrete. The clock is scored all or nothing, zero or two points, because it has been shown to be a very sensitive marker of early cognitive decline. The word recall, one point is scored for each word recalled. This is a screenshot of one of the variety of mini-cog forms available. You can find this form on the Act on Alzheimer's website. There are many different varieties. You can see that this particular form also offers scoring instructions. The MINICOG is scored uh, a four or greater, equal to or greater to a four is a pass, and a three or less is a fail. The MINICOG is a good tool for minimizing bias associated with education and culture, although no tool is perfect. Although it takes a, th a third as long to administer, the MINICOG has the same or better sensitivity and specificity as the MMSE. And Probably most importantly, research has shown that if a patient cannot pass the mini-cog, they cannot fill a pillbox correctly. So not only is this a very quick measure of cognitive function, it's also a good indication about the patient's functional status and ability to comply with general treatment recommendations, which is very important. Now, I'd like to introduce you to Colleen. Colleen is a real person. I've met her. Uh, she's a delightful lady. 66 years old, she presented to primary care with memory complaints. Her daughter complains that uh, Colleen's short-term memory is very poor, and that began a year or two ago, but is getting worse. Colleen has a history of low blood sugar, heart attack, and repeat hospitalizations for atrial flutter. She has frequent medication changes, but she's managing, or she says she's managing her medications independently. She is a retired accountant for a family business uh, that her husband uh, still continues to run. And she's referred to care coordination for her heart disease. I'm gonna show you a video of Colleen taking the Minicog screening tool. Hi Colleen, it's nice to see you. Thank you, it's good to be here. It's been about six months, I think, since your last clinic visit. Yes. 
I understand from the nurse that you're here because of some dizziness that you've had recently. Yes, I am. Yeah, sounds pretty bothersome. It is. Well, before we look into that a little bit more, we're doing something new in the clinic, um, which is that just like the nurse was checking your vital signs, your pulse, your blood pressure, we're now also checking the health of the brain on a routine basis. Okay. And so I'm going to ask you some questions next that require a little bit of concentration. Sound okay? okay? Okay. The first thing is I want you to listen carefully because I'm going to give you three words that I want you to repeat back to me and try to remember for later. Okay. okay? You ready? Mm-hmm. Okay. The words are banana, sunrise, chair. Can you say those back to me? Banana. Sunrise. I don't remember the last word. Okay. The, the three words are banana, sunrise, and chair. Can ben you see those? Banana, back? sunrise, and chair. Great. Now, I'm going to give you this piece of paper with a circle on it. And what I want you to do is make a clock for me by putting in all the numbers where they go. Now, Colleen, can you set the time so it says 10 past 11? Okay, I'll take that back from you. Now, what were those three words that I had you repeat earlier? Sunrise. Banana, shampoo. Okay, great, thank you. Colleen, have you had any concerns about your memory recently? Yes. What kind of concerns? That I'm forgetting a lot. Okay, what kinds of things have you been forgetting? Um, things that I'm supposed to do during the day that I normally do mm -hmm. are like when I go into a room to get something, I don't remember why I'm in there. Mm -hmm. And then I start cleaning and doing other things. And then I remember what I went in for. And sometimes I don't. Mm -hmm. That's really frustrating. Very. Well, maybe once we're done with today's visit, uh, it might be a good idea to have you come back so that we can look into that a little bit more. Would that be okay? Yes, that would be fine. Okay, sounds good. So let's take a look at how Colleen did. First, let's look at her clock. You can see that Colleen put all of the anchor numbers in the correct locations. Now, when you're scoring clocks, generally, you're looking for the numbers, all of the numbers to be present, and for the anchor numbers, the 12, the 3, the 6, and the 9, to be relatively in their proper locations. It does not matter if the numbers are on the outside or the inside of the circle. And it does not matter if one hand is longer than the other. So Colleen got the anchor numbers right, but she transposed the numbers 4 and 5, and she set the hands at the 10 and the 2, which is 10 past 10, not 10 past 11 as instructed. So she would receive zero points for this clock. Let's look at the form. How did she do on the word recall? Colleen remembered two of the three words, so she received two points for word recall. She received zero points for the clock draw, as we mentioned before, so her total score is two out of five, which is a screen fail. Remember, a passing score is a four or a five. This would indicate that Colleen needs additional testing, such as an additional screening exam like the slums or MOCA, which we'll talk about next, or she needs to be referred back to her physician for a, a, a cognitive workup. Because the clock draw is the most difficult element to score in a mini cog exam, we're going to go through a series of clocks and see how well we can score them. Take a look at this clock. Visuospatial problems, which have affected the spacing or location of the numbers in this clock, uh, make it a screen fail. Take a look at the anchor numbers, the 12, 6, 3, and 9. 
you can note that the 10 is where the 9 should be. Therefore, this is a zero point clock. It's important to take spacing of the anchor numbers into account because this is how we incorporate evaluation of patients' physiospatial functions, which often deteriorate in the course of Alzheimer's disease. Let's look at another. Here you see there are clear spacing deficits. The anchor numbers are not in their proper place and the time is represented by a single hand. This is a common response observed by patients with early dementia and it is a clock fail. Let's look at another. A small percentage of patients will draw the numbers on the outside of the clock and as I mentioned before, this is considered a normal variation so it's not counted against them. In this clock, all the numbers are represented and the anchor numbers are in their correct locations. There's a slight gap between a, the two and the three, but it does not affect the position of the anchor numbers. The hands are set appropriately. Again, note that the length of the hands does not matter when scoring the minicog. So this score uh, is a two points, full score for this clock. It's a pass. Let's look at clock number four. The time is represented here by an X instead of the hands of the clock. This is a number, another common response observed by patients with early dementia. It becomes difficult for them to think abstractly, so they com compromise by making a little mark like this one between the 10 and 11. This is not how we typically uh, draw a clock, and it's zero points. It's a screen, uh, a clock fail, excuse me. Clock number five. You can see here that not all the numbers of the clock are represented. Sometimes patients will lose steam and stop short of completing the clock because of confusion. Alternatively, they may become stuck in a certain process such as numbering and will keep adding numbers past the 12, like uh, 12, 13, 14, 15, or they may perseverate on a number, one, two, three, four, five, six, 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 six. You can see here that this could also indicate visuospatial problems. Um, and so you, you want to keep a lookout for how they're driving. Uh, generally speaking, though, this is a clock fail and the patient needs additional testing. Clock number six is tricky to score. First look at the numbers. All are represented and there are no missing or duplicate numbers. The 12 and the six are in their correct locations. There is a space between the three and the four where the three should be positioned. Because another number other than three is not occupying the anchor position, we would give the patient the benefit of the doubt and ignore this issue. Points are deducted when it is clear that the anchor position is occupied by another number. Now look at the eight and the nine. The patient drew two eights but recognized and self-corrected the error by scribbling one of the eights out. This error forced them to draw the nine a bit higher than normal. Because the patient self-corrected their error, we would also give them a pass here as well. They have successfully set the time for 10 past 11. Note that the fulcrum of the hands does not need to be centered in the middle of the clock face. This is a full point clock, two points. And finally, clock number seven. This is a beautiful looking clock. You can see that the six is slightly out of position, but not enough to take away points. Remember, unless another number occupies the anchor position, mild spacing, spacing issues are not considered errors. So this is a full point clock, two points, and a clock pass. So I hope that gives you a little bit of practice scoring the Minicog. Let's talk about the slums. Again, terrible name, great test. It stands for the St. Louis University Mental Status Examination. It's much more sensitive to early cognitive decline when compared to the MMSE, for example. The reason is that the tool incorporates more questions involving working memory and executive functions, which are typically early markers of dementia. You'll notice that some of the questions are worth more than one point. This relative weighting of certain questions also makes the instrument more sensitive by putting greater emphasis on certain cognitive functions that are good early indicators of cognitive impairment. The slums is scored out of a possible 30 points, just like the MMSC, so that is helpful. If you knew what a 15 was like on the MMSC, it will be a similar thing on the slums. An additional benefit to the slums is that it takes into account level of education. On this instrument, the cutoff score is lower if a patient is not graduated from high school, giving them extra points, if you will, for normal mistakes on the test. You can see on the Act on Alzheimer's website, which is listed here below, um, 
an example of Colleen, the patient we met earlier, taking the, the slums. So you can see an administration video as well as download copies of the test form and um, watch a scoring webinar. The MOCA is considered by many to be the most sensitive cognitive screening tool in existence at this current time. The instrument incorporates many more measures of executive functioning and like the slums, raises the bar of normal aging to a higher and more appropriate level. The MOCA is translated into over 30 languages and there is even a version for the vision impaired. This is very helpful when working with patients who are not native English speakers who or who have disabilities. All forms and scoring material can be downloaded for free online. Although this test is a very sensitive measure of dementia, it takes approximately 15 minutes to administer, so it's not a quick screening tool. It's more of a, a backup after a, a mini-cog or a shorter exam has failed. Like the MMSC and the slums, the MOCA is scored out of a possible 30 points, which is helpful, again, because if you know what a 15 is like on the MMSC, it will be relatively similar on the MOCA. For the MOCA, a pass is greater than or equal to 26, and a fail is 25 or less. Again, on the Act on Alzheimer's website, you can see another patient, Sam, um, taking the MOCA. You can also find, uh, in addition to this video of the tool being administered, you can download the MOCA scoring form and watch a webinar of um, scoring for this particular test. There are many tests to, to choose from, like I said. Um, this particular slide gives you some information on specificity and sensitivity of these instruments. You can see that the MMSC is only able to correctly, to, to correctly identify MCI and dementia in 18% and 78% of, out of 100 uh, cases. So it's not very robust. It's kind of a dull and blunt instrument. So we, again, we recommend using an objective instrument that is more sensitive. The family questionnaire can be used if a family member is present to gauge what and how many signs of dementia um, care, caregivers have observed. Uh, note that it is not an objective measure of a patient's cognitive status, but it reflects the opinion of a caregiver, typically one caregiver, although you could administer to multiple caregivers. So it does not take the place of objective assessment, but it can give you some additional information. Um, it's nice because it's five questions, so it's pretty quick and gives you a little bit of an understanding of how the patient's family is observing change, how and if, I guess, the patient's family is observing change. Let's take a minute to talk about treatment. Many of your patients with dementia may be taking the, the drugs that you see above, um, and in some cases that may be the only sign in the medical record that dementia is present. There are two classes of drug to, drugs to treat cognitive symptoms, and these may also have an impact on behavioral symptoms. The first class are anticholinergics, um, and the second are NMDA receptor antagonists like memantine would be the example of that. All of these drugs have side effects, which you might keep on the lookout for as you work with patients. There are also medications, uh, antipsychotics, antidepressants, and mood stabilizers that are used to treat comorbid depression and to manage behavioral symptoms. So you may see these in the patient's record. Act on Alzheimer's has an additional flow chart, uh, a tool for managing behaviors, which can be accessed uh, at the link below. Drugs play a much more minor role in the treatment of dementia. Psychosocial interventions are critical to improving quality of life and quality of care, and care coordinators play a major role, obviously, in this. So now we're going to shift gears. We've talked about how to identify patients in your caseload who may have cognitive impairment. Again, once someone is identified, you would refer them to the physician for additional testing or do additional testing yourself and then share that information with the patient's physician. You wanna shoot for a diagnosis in the medical record and then once a diagnosis is made, focus on what can be done to coordinate this patient's care. The ACT practice tool you can see at the top includes the screening information and then a little bit of a deeper dive in care coordination. Taking a look at the gray box, 
This details what happens after a patient receives a diagnosis. This is a short version followed by, if you open the tool, the next page, which shows detailed descriptions um, on building in elements of the care plan unique to people living with dementia and their care partners or caregivers. We know that care managers already know how to do care management, so the remainder of the talk will not be focused on how to do care coordination or how to do care management, or, but rather how to, we'll hit some highlights of how dementia impacts um, how you do care management or care coordination when the patient has cognitive impairment or dementia. All right, first, identifying a care partner and noting this person's information in the medical record is critical. If the patient cannot identify an obvious care partner, you can help them think outside of the box. Remind them that this is a disease that is a marathon, not a sprint, and it is a team sport, not an individual sport. This disease requires a team approach if the patient is to remain independent and well. The care partner or caregiver does not have to be just one person. In fact, it can be different people who help with specific tasks or activities, and the person does not need to be a family member or even a close friend. It is clear that without a solid, well-informed team, a person with dementia is at higher risk for health crises and for institutionalization. So let's take a minute to look at comprehensive assessment. You probably have your own comprehensive assessment form. That said, a toolkit of resources, including dementia tools and resources, was developed for Minnesota Healthcare Homes. You can access it via the link listed on this slide. On page six of this handbook, um, there is a comprehensive patient assessment form, which you might wanna take a look at. Uh, especially if you don't have a form that you're using already. In terms of comprehensive assessment, best practice dementia care management must include assessment of the care team, both the patient and a care partner. Now this is a bit of a departure for how things are done with other chronic health conditions, but with Alzheimer's disease, again, remember this is a team sport and the team is the patient in dementia care, not just the patient, it's the team. I do want to also point out that in this presentation, I've been using the term care partner, which is the preferred term used by uh, people who are uh, the caregiver, if you will, of someone with very early dementia, the spouse, the friend, what have you. People um, who are partnered with someone uh, who has early dementia do not feel that they are giving care. They feel more like they're a partner in care. Um, it's only later uh, that these individuals uh, may uh, identify as a giver of care or caregiver. So with the patient and the primary care partner or caregiver, uh, of course you would always identify language, cultural and health equity barriers. Um, if you don't have access to this information in the medical record, you certainly would want to identify the physicians involved so that you can communicate with them, uh, taking a look at substance use or mid misuse in both individuals, as well as behavioral health in both individuals. Uh, and there are some tools here described on the, t the slide that can be used for that. You should also consider assessing cognition of the caregiver if the caregiver is over 65 or signs or symptoms are present. I've had many, many instances where a caregiver brings in a patient um, or I'm seeing them both together and the caregiver is talking about uh, the patient's cognitive impairment, but I actually note that there are signs or red flags for cognitive impairment in the caregiver. And when um, delivering an assessment measure on that person, uh, note that the caregiver's cognitive impairment is perhaps even more severe than the patient's. So obviously a cognitively impaired care partner is not going to be an effective care partner, so additional interventions or additional care partners certainly would need to be recruited to the team. Caregiver burden is also, also useful to assess. Um, if a patient uh, has burden, obviously they'll be, I'm, I'm sorry, if a caregiver has burden, obviously they'll be less effective in uh, 
supporting the patient. I will note here that caregiver burden is not necessarily correlated with the number of caregiving tasks that a patient or that a caregiver needs to um, conduct with a patient. So for example, I've met many caregivers who have had to do one or two caregiving tasks who feel completely burdened. And I've met with other caregivers who have a uh, hundred tasks that they're doing. They're pretty much working 24-7 caregiving and have had relatively very little burden. So caregiver burden not associated with the number of tasks. Now that we've assessed the patient, let's move on to the care plan. You can see in the ACT care coordination tool that there are recommendations in each of these areas. We'll be covering some highlights in each. Let's start with disease education. The very first thing to think about is how much does the patient and the care partner understand about what the doctor told them about their memory loss or their diagnosis, if anything? What do they know about the disease? And what are their biggest concerns or their, are the barriers to care or health care? This is very important. I will tell you that even the in the best case situations in a doctor visit, when a patient is told they have Alzheimer's disease, they will hear that and nothing else, even if the doctor tells them, wonderful information and connects them to resources. Um, it's a bit like Charlie Brown's teacher, wonk, 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 after Alzheimer's disease is diagnosed. So you can play a vital role by assessing the patient and the care partner's knowledge about what the doctor said and helping to fill in the gaps. There are many education resources for patients and caregivers out there including print materials from the Alzheimer's Association, from the National Institute on Aging, and others. Uh, just a plethora of resources for families. Uh, you can contact the Alzheimer's Association, and I've listed the links for all of these resources in the References and Resources section of this slide deck. After a Diagnosis is a tool produced by Act on Alzheimer's for families with a new diagnosis. It reviews critical elements of uh, what to do after a diagnosis is delivered, like how to partner with doctors, understanding the disease, reinforcing that this is a team approach to a disease, that this is a team sport, um, the importance of planning ahead, asking for help, which is very difficult for people, especially Minnesotans, I think, um, using community resources, and perhaps uh, most importantly for this audience, the role of the care coordinator. What is it that the care coordinator is doing and why does a patient or a family need this very valuable resource? The Taking Action Workbook is um, a tool that was developed by the Alzheimer's Association and it provides useful information about the disease and its effective management for patients and care partners. It's in a workbook format. It gives background information on all of the topics on the slide as well as um, places for the patient and the caregiver to identify what they will do or what action steps they will take. It's a great tool for care managers to work together with patients and families to develop a plan and it covers the major areas uh, through research that we've discovered are the biggest concerns of patients and families who have a new diagnosis or who have earlier symptoms of the disease, like understanding the disease, partnering with doctors again, uh, disclosing the diagnosis, which can be very uh, worrisome for people, strategies for managing symptoms and coping, as well as safety and legal and financial issues, which are so critical, uh, especially making these decisions early on when the patient still has capacity. If you're curious about the stages of Alzheimer's disease, and many patients and families are, the back page of the ACT care coordination tool um, has ribbons that describe the basic symptoms in all of the stages, including mild cognitive impairment, early stage, middle stage, and late stage. Again, you don't, this is a progressive disease and people may go in and out of symptoms or in and out of stages. Uh, it's not like you wake up one day in middle stage. Um, it's a gradually progressive disease, but generally speaking, this gives you uh, some sense of how the disease progresses through the different stages. 
Many people with dementia have multiple coexisting chronic health conditions that may exacerbate dementia symptoms. In fact, um, about 30% have coronary artery disease, about 30% have diabetes, 22% heart failure, 17% chronic kidney disease, uh, 17% COPD, etc. Sleep disturbance, incontinence, and the presence of dementia-related behavioral symptoms, especially wandering and aggressive behavior, are predictors of long-term care p- placement. And environmental changes that have and effective communication strategies can help reduce dementia-related behavior. What's most important to think about here is what other diseases or other behaviors can exacerbate dementia symptoms. So educating families on how to work with and prevent and communicate around dementia-related behavior, um, how to maximize independence through changing the environment, and paying attention to uh, tight management of uh, chronic diseases that uh, left unchecked can really exacerbate uh, dementia-related symptoms is critical. Managing medications is critically important for people with Alzheimer's disease or related dementia. Um, The failure to manage medications can land someone in the hospital, and care coordinators can play a critical role in helping the care team to plan for how medications will be managed. You'll recall that fail, failure of a minicog, which would be anyone with dementia has would fail a minicog, is correlated with the inability to manage a pillbox independently, which means the inability to manage medications essentially. So uh, you can play a vital role in creating a plan with the care team, including the patient and the family, for managing medications including implementing management aids like pill boxes or alarms and creating and reviewing a medication log, which we'll talk about next. Many older adults also have very complicated medication recommendation, I'm sorry, regimens. And you can take a look at this. Um, There are drugs that are contraindicated for people with dementia, like anything that has anticholinergic properties, things like Benadryl, even over-the-counter medications that are anticholinergic. Obviously, benzodiazepines, sedative hypnotics, and narcotics are not great for promoting um, a clear cognitive state. So watching out for that and educating on that can be important. The Taking Action Workbook contains a medication log that can be used by families to keep track of things and brought to each doctor visit. Care managers can help review this log to ensure that it matches what is in the medical record and to assess compliance. Health, wellness, and engagement. Perhaps one of the most important things that is often overlooked is talking with patients with dementia about lifestyle changes that can reduce the impact of their symptoms. The Living Well Workbook, which was produced by the Alzheimer's Association, provides evidence-based recommendations regarding the topics listed on this slide. Oftentimes, when people are given this diagnosis, the focus is on what they can't do, but what they really want to know is what they can do and what the research says. You can give hope and support by helping people to understand what they can do to reduce the impact of their symptoms like exercise, eating well, reducing stress, continuing to find meaning and purpose in life, strengthening relationships with friends and families, managing health or other comorbid chronic conditions, and establishing regular routines. Routine is actually critically important. Establishing a routine that incorporates lifestyle adjustments early in the disease progression will serve to support the patient as the disease progresses. Routines rely on procedural memory, which is relatively spared in Alzheimer's disease and can compensate for short-term and long-term memory deficits later on in the disease. For example, a patient may have a routine to have breakfast every day at 9 a.m., This structure will help support the patient when they are increasingly confused about what to do later in the illness. The family can also reinforce this routine by saying something like, it's 9 a.m., time for breakfast. Meaningful engagement, finding purpose, 
uh, is very important. And one way that patients and families often can find this is through participa- participation in research. The Alzheimer's Association has a service called Trial Match, which is very easy to use. It's free um, and helps match patients and caregivers actually uh, with current studies that are available in their area. The National Institutes of Health has a clinical trial site called clinicaltrials.gov. I find it to be a little bit harder to navigate, and it doesn't just include information on trials for Alzheimer's disease. So unless you're pretty savvy about doing internet searches, um, trial match might be a better option for patients. Let's talk about home and personal safety, also critical. Having a plan for home and personal safety can bring peace of mind and reduce risk for crises that often result in excess disability. It's very important to educate and develop a plan for what I'll call the five F's, fire, falls, firearms, finances, and freeways. The last time I gave this talk, a gentleman in the audience added a sixth F, which was freedom, which I really like. So you might want to take independence into account as well. Occupational therapy and physical therapy can, um, that kind of referral can really help with fall risk assessment, sensory and mobility aids, home safety inspection and modifications, and of course, driving, which would be the freeways, um, driving evaluation. Um, On a a personal note, um, giving up the keys is, is very difficult. And uh, one thing that you can do, and one thing that my family did, um, is to call the Department of uh, Motor Vehicles and report that a person um, is having issues with driving uh, due to a suspected cognitive impairment. Um, That person will be called in and given a road test, which is very um, helpful because uh, that allows the individual with dementia to um, take a objective test to see if their driving is okay. Many people with early dementia may pass this test and that's great, but they get to prove uh, themselves whether or not uh, driving is still an option for them if there are difficulties in this area. Um, It's important to have emergency plans, um, phone numbers, hospital, fire, of course, advanced directives, I think most people are aware that um, if someone has a directive, a do not resuscitate uh, directive, that uh, in order for emergency medical personnel to follow that directive, there must be a pulse and it must be um, by the bedside. It's also useful to keep a med list by the bedside and have plans in place for hospitalization as well, which we'll turn uh, to a little bit later. You can also encourage enrollment in the Medic Alert Safe Return Program, which is an Alzheimer's Association program, which is a a bracelet that has medical information and also can connect people who become lost or wander. We know that 60% or more of people with Alzheimer's disease will become lost or wander at some time during the illness, so it's useful to know that and to have a plan in place. There's really nothing scarier than having someone disappear in a mall and not know what happened to them. The other thing that I'll just say about the five F's briefly is firearms. Uh, Many people have guns. um, And in fact, when we polled people about what was their biggest concern about a diagnosis in terms of what privileges they might use, lose, I thought it would be driving. It was actually firearms, guns fear of losing um, access to guns. So be aware of this and uh, begin to develop a plan early about gun safety and and how guns will be managed. Let's talk about hospitalization. People with dementia have more preventable hospitalizations than non-demented elderly adults. Hospital patients with dementia experience higher rates of delirium, falls, new incontinence, indwelling urinary catheters, pressure ulcers, functional decline, and new feeding tubes. Hospital patients with dementia are significantly less likely than other older hospitalized patients to regain their pre-admission functional abilities at one month, three months, or even one year after discharge. Among older hospitalized patients admitted from home, those with dementia are two to four times more likely to be discharged directly to a nursing home and three to seven times more likely to be living in a nursing home three months after discharge. It's very clear 
and the research speaks loudly that hospitalization is terrible for people with dementia and should be avoided if possible. You can really help to reduce unnecessary hospitalization by paying attention to factors that produce unnecessary hospitalization like reducing fall risk, taking a look at managing urinary tract infections and other medical conditions, making sure that there's a concrete plan for medication. Medication mi mismanagement is a surefire way to get into the hospital. Helping families manage dementia-related behavior and discussing with families hospitalization alternatives. Many people take patients with dementia to the hospital because they don't know what else to do. You can help by educating patients about what else they can do and why hospitalization um, can be damaging. Certainly, uh, many people uh, leave the hospital with less cognitive abil abilities than, than when they went in. There's really good brochures available, and you can help families to pre-plan for a hospitalization. Um, a great brochure, Hospitalization Happens, and Planning for a Hospital Visit for People with Dementia. Really great to review with your families. If you want to help people remain independent, and that's your goal, talking about hospitalization is vital. It's also important as early as possible to begin to talk about legal and advanced care planning. Um, in, in current, really everyone should have a health care and durable power of attorney. Um, I often encourage the patient and the care partner to both set this up. That way it's not so stigmatizing, you know, a let's do this together kind of approach. Um, and it's very important for everyone really to discuss and document preferences for care. There are many tools for doing this. And of course, as the disease progresses or as a relationship develops, um, discussing palliative and hospice care options are very important. It's also important to uh, make sure that the patient and the care partner know when you want to see them or when they should be seeing their physician. While those, there is no formal recommendation for regular check-ins, um, consider monthly check-ins or at least three months um, for at least the first three months after a diagnosis is made and thereafter three to six month check-ins. More frequent, frequent check-ins may be needed when the patient or the care partner has higher needs or in transition or are actively managing other comorbid conditions or behavioral um, changes, experiencing behavioral symptoms. You can educate the patient and the family about when you'd like to see them or things that you'd like them to call you about, like changes in their condition, assistance with medication management. Um, certainly you wanna talk with them before or after a hospitalization, if they move to a different living environment or if they have any new needs. This is a sample appointment log that can be found in the Taking Action Workbook. Note that the log encourages patients and care partners to plan ahead for doctor visits by writing down the, their top three concerns that they'd like to address at the doctor visit, taking notes during the visit, and writing a to-do list of doctor-recommended actions. There's also a space to write details about the next appointment, which should be scheduled at the visit. Patients with dementia should schedule appointments to see the doctor on a regular basis, every six months or more frequently as needed, and you can help the patient and the family know how to work proactively with physicians to get the best health care. Many people ask about HIPAA and HIPAA's relationship to care partners being able to be with the patient in a doctor's visit. There's a really good brochure, which is referenced here, on communicating with a patient's family, friends, and others involved in patient's care. Um, I will say that HIPAA was not designed to keep caregivers or partners out of the doctor's office, especially when a patient has um, cognitive impairment. Um, and HIPAA does allow uh, certain people to see information, including doctors, nurses, therapists, and other healthcare professionals on the patient's medical team. Family caregivers and others directly involved with the patient's care may also access this information and be in a doctor's visit unless the patient explicitly says that he or she does not want this information shared with others. 
And even if the person does say that, if they're deemed to be cognitively impaired, the doctor can uh, override that decision. So HIPAA should not be a barrier for patients to be with um, care partners in a doctor visit. So let's focus a little bit on caregivers just for a moment because I think it's very important. Often in care coordination, at least in the medical setting, the patient is the focus, but caregivers are instrumental to the patient's success in managing a treatment plan. Caregivers have many risks. Caregiving comes with many risks, including physical, social, psychological, and financial risks. Um, caregiving increases, increases the risk of health problems. Caregivers frequently suffer from fe feelings of social isolation. They're at increased risk for depression and burden. And caregiving places significant financial burdens on caregivers due to lost wages and cost of care. Alzheimer's disease is a very long disease. It can last 10 to 20 years, and it's a very expensive disease. This presents a major obstacle and burden for care families. Providing support for a dementia caregiver is a social imperative. We know that 70% of individuals with Alzheimer's disease live at home. We know that caregivers uh, provide an incredible amount of unpaid uh, care and that we, we know that we could not do our jobs as healthcare providers and could not sustain the cost of care without caregivers as team members. So it's important to pay attention to these risks and costs and help to support the caregiver in their role of caring for your patient. So I'm going to wrap up with a highlight reel, top five resources for patients and families. So let's hit it. Number one, don't forget to focus on promoting wellness and function. So important. Many families and patients ask what else they can do besides taking medication. These resources are their guide. Help them to understand that there is hope. Encourage them to exercise, to eat well, and to find purpose and well-being. Encourage them with coping strategies for the illness and telling others about the disease. Help them to engage in meaningful activities and purposeful activities. Keep them socially connected. A focus here is really important because it's positive and it gives hope, and that can alleviate depression and reduce excess disability. Number two, address behavioral challenges. As the disease progresses, patients will, may have behavioral challenges. There are many excellent resources for this, and this could be a whole talk in and of itself. Um, the first uh, resource, Understanding Difficult Behaviors, is my favorite. Uh, it's excellent. Uh, it's for providers, um, for professionals, but it goes through each type of behavior that you, common behaviors in people with Alzheimer's disease and gives you uh, health and environmental triggers that may be causing or exacerbating this and possible strategies for reducing this type of behavior. It's excellent. There's also a really good um, book called Coach Broyles Playbook for Alzheimer's Caregivers. It reinforces the team approach. It actually use, uses football as an analogy, so it's really great for male caregivers but talks about what caregivers can do to engage a team to win the game, if you will. The book, The Alzheimer's Action Plan, provides really excellent resources throughout all stages of the disease. It's good for professionals. It's also good for families. And then there's Act on Alzheimer's, which has a, a, a numerous tools um, that can help you think through um, behavioral issues and how to help. Remember with behavioral issues that um, the patient cannot change, cannot learn new information. So everything um, needs to focus around changing the person who's interacting with the patient, the caregiver or other person, changing that person's behavior or changing the environment. Number three, driving. Uh, driving is a huge issue, um, mostly because it represents a, a loss in terms of independence. Uh, so focusing on driving alternatives, talking about driving retirement, very important. There are some great resources here. The Alzheimer's Association has a driving resource center, which is depicted on the left. It's 
excellent. It shows videos of real people talking about driving retirement with each other in a very supportive way. Um, I will give you a spoiler alert. Uh, if you are an emotional person, um, are, are prone to becoming tearful during especially sensitive advertisements on television, uh, you may want to close your door before you watch these videos because uh, they are tear jerkers. Uh, but really, really excellent. Uh, At the Crossroads is a uh, workbook produced by the Hartford Foundation that's excellent and provides driving contracts for individuals about giving away the keys. Of course, it's a lot easier to give up the keys if there are driving alternatives in place, like uh, Metro Mobility or other um, taxis or other um, transportation buses services noting that people with dementia may no longer as the disease progresses be able to follow that kind of routine but setting up even friends and family to take someone somewhere um, is critically important it's a lot easier to get someone to retire from driving if they have alternatives to uh, doing what they want to do number four planning assistance so important to have uh, long-term care plans in place, uh, healthcare directives, you see the post here, but also maybe most importantly, plans for uh, emergency situations and hospitalization or including hospitalization. And number five, connect to resources. Absolutely critically important that uh, medical systems and community support services be connected the Alzheimer's Association is a one-stop shop for a care consultation, which is uh, working with families to get on the same plan. Uh, support groups, including uh, groups for people with early dementia, and they have a 24-7 information helpline that can answer any question that families might have and connect people with resources in the community. The Senior Linkage Line, which is a one-stop shop for connections to services as well, as well as help understanding housing options, help with Medicare and other public and private health and service benefits. One thing that I will say about connecting to services, whatever, whatever service you may use, and I would recommend at the very least connecting with these two, is that um, some research at the Alzheimer's Association indicated that um, even when people were given a referral to the Alzheimer's Association um, by their physician, families waited an average of two to three years before actually making that connection. So it's vitally important to follow up with people. Did they make a connection with the, the referrals that you made? How did that go? And even uh, I would encourage you to make warm referrals, connecting people while you're on the phone uh, with other resources to make sure that handoff is actually made. Um, it's wonderful if there's a reciprocal referral situation where the Alzheimer's Association can give information back to you uh, or the senior linkage line could give information back to you about what the family is doing. Uh, that, that's ideal. If you're interested in an, watching an in-person uh, post-diagnostic uh, care coordination session, uh, there's a complete session online at the Act on Alzheimer's site, as well as two short video vignettes around medications and legal planning that you can use as case studies if you're interested. And the link is here on the slide. If you have additional questions or for more information or to download Act on Alzheimer's practice tools, you can visit the Act on Alzheimer's website. Again, there's a video section of the website which includes all of the screening videos as well as scoring webinars and the care coordination um, information. I wanna thank you for being here today and participating in this webinar. And I'd like to thank the um, Health Resources and Services Administration. This work was uh, due to a grant that came through the Minnesota Area Geriatric Education Center or MAGIC Center at the University of Minnesota and we thank them for their support. There are many resources and references available uh, at the end of this slide deck which I hope will be useful to you. Thank you again and have a great day.